morning, everybody. It's really nice to be here. And my name is Pastor Ryan Schindler, and I recently moved to Roseville a few months ago. We're from, uh, we moved from Santa Rosa. I was born and raised in Petaluma, and I've been a pastor now for 21 years. Served, started out serving uh, two churches as youth pastor, then English pastor in a Chinese church, and then the last 13 years as senior pastor at Craig Avenue Baptist Church in Sonoma. I'd like to introduce my family this morning. It's my wife, Mary, and son, Cameron. He's 13 years old, and Christopher's nine years old. Well, one thing... <laughs> One thing our family enjoys is watching the Olympics. Um, we like sports and we wish it came around more than every uh, four years for, well, I guess it alternates between um, summer Olympics and winter Olympics every couple of years. But uh, one group of sports that's always interesting to watch is um, ice skating, gymnastics, snowboarding, and a the more recent one, they added skateboarding as well. And one thing all of these sports have in common is they give you points for whatever moves you can pull off. And there are a lot of moves, flips, turns, and twists that anybody at the Olympic level could do. So they give you less points for doing the maneuvers that everybody could do. But well, if you could do extra flips and twists and turns, you get more points. And so the athlete has to think about it. Do I want to go for more points and risk wiping out and getting a poor score? But if I land it, I'll probably end up getting a medal. And a lot of them decide to really go for the gold. I know in ice skating, they kept saying that the quad moves, four twists, four turns, were really hard to pull off, uh, dangerous that you might slip and fall. Well, probably not dangerous for them. They're all young. Those are probably dangerous maneuvers if you're over 40. <laughs> Gold medalist Nathan Chen was known for taking risks. They call him the Quad King. And all through the commentary, they keep wondering, is anybody going to try a quadruple axle? That's where you're ice skating. You get going full speed. Going forward, you jump up and do four twists around, and you land going backwards. Well, nobody's yet to pull that off, but everybody believes it's possible, but nobody's yet as far as I know, risk that in competition because they've probably tried it in their daily practice and fallen down more often than not. So here's the question, do you, do you skip the hard parts or do you go for the gold? Well, the same applies to studying the Bible. When we read the Bible, there's lots of hard parts in there, hard to understand. We're prone to sometimes read through it and skip the difficult parts. Where I say that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, so I'm just going to keep going. I led a Bible study recently where we did one of those parables of Jesus that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It was about the dishonest manager. And Jesus was using an example of dishonesty in order to teach something. And one lady kept saying, I just don't want to deal with this. This is just making me nervous. I've read this many times and just skipped it. I want to skip it. I feel like you're... And then at the end, she said, I feel like you really forced me to deal with that. And I'm glad I did. It really taught me something about skipping the hard parts versus working through the hard parts. What do you guys do with the hard parts of Scripture? Anybody ever done a Bible reading plan before? Uh, 
Probably the most popular is you try to read through the Bible in a year. You read three chapters a day, and usually that plan will give you one day off so you can play catch up because life happens. We all get busy doing different things, and hey, we can all we can all skip a day, so you have a day to catch up. And so, if you make a New Year's resolution, you start it in January. Where do we start? We start with Genesis. Genesis is an incredible book. I mean, you have the creation of the world, God speaking the universe into existence. You have Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, the story of Noah and his ark and the flood. And then you get into the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Very relatable stories. Very exciting reading. Believer or non-believer, everybody calls it good literature. And then you get into Exodus. In Exodus, you have the story of God freeing his people that have been oppressed as slaves and leading them into the promised land. Very exciting. So Genesis, Exodus, and then you have Leviticus which is a book of laws that apply to the Old Covenant. Is Leviticus anybody's favorite book? No, me either, and I've, I don't know if I've met anybody that does. So we do Genesis, Exodus, and then we get derailed a lot of the time. The through the Bible plan sometimes just stops right there. Congratulations to you if you've ever kept going and made it through it. And that's why some of these other Bibles have become popular that have the one-year Bible that breaks it up. It'll give you an Old Testament reading, a New Testament reading, and a lot of the time a psalm or proverb in there as well so that it helps us to be able to get through some of those hard parts. I want to do a hard look at a hard-to-read passage today to give us an example of something that probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense when we first read it, but working through it can be very rich. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 19. Leviticus chapter 19 starts off with the Lord speaking to Moses, saying, Moses, here are my laws and decrees. I want you to write this down. I want you to give this to my people. And God's saying this because it's important. In Leviticus 19.19, 19, Keep my decrees. Do not mate different kinds of animals. Do not plant your field with two kinds of seed. Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. And this comes after a lot of the moral laws that he's given that I quite frankly make a whole lot more sense of why that we treat other people justly and fairly as God would want us to be treated. And then we have this. Now, rather than scratching our heads and keeping on reading, we have to stop and say, well, it's in the Bible for a reason. Well, what reason could that be? What does God want us to know? Now, don't wear clothing of two kinds of material. Does anybody here have a cotton polyester shirt on or dress on this morning? Did you, did you check your tags? Did you, did you look at this before you go to the store? Have you ever heard this preached in a sermon? Well, this is the first time I've heard it as well. Well, what's... What's wrong with wearing a blended shirt or dress? Or what about the two kinds of animals? There's not too many different kinds of animals you could breed successfully. I only know a couple. You can breed a lion and a tiger into a liger. Zoos like to do it. But maybe the only common one is a mule. Does anybody have a mule? Well, curious thing about them, a mule is a breed between a horse and a donkey. You make a meal. Meals are useful because they're very, they're very sure-footed. But what's wrong with a mule? Well, meals can't reproduce. You can breed a meal, but you can't reproduce a meal. You keep needing a horse and a donkey to reproduce a meal. Or what about two different kinds of seed? 
I've done it before. I like growing tomatoes and squash because they're, they're good to eat. Well, this is the old covenant. Does this have any relevance for Christians being under the new covenant? The old covenant passed away with Jesus' death and resurrection. Well, does Scripture address this elsewhere? Deuteronomy chapter 22, 9 repeats the same thing, almost. Do not plant two different kinds of seeds in your vineyard. If you do, not only the crops you plant, but also the fruit of the vineyard will be defiled. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Do not wear clothes of wool and linen woven together. Why did God put this in the Bible? As I've stated, the Bible can have some parts that are confusing. It can be easy and even tempting for pastors especially to pretend they know it all by having simplistic answers to it. I don't understand every single passage. I'm still 20-some years as a pastor. I'm still learning. Every time I read the Bible, it seems like I'm seeing something new or working through a new one that I have questions about. But I believe this. Everything in the Bible is there for a reason. The Word tells us so. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All Scripture, not some Scripture, not even most Scripture, but all scripture. Well, so let's get back. Let's get back to Leviticus about don't mix animals, don't mix seeds, don't mix kinds of materials. Well, after pouring through commentary on it, I also googled it. Google had many interesting theories, but my favorite that Google said is. You shouldn't wear mixed kinds of garments because, well, a cotton and wool blend makes a low-quality garment, and you, you mix them together, your shirt or dress might shrink you regularly. I hate it when clothes shrink in the dryer. We've all done that, but a conclusion of Googling it said, God wants you to wear nice clothes. <laughs> Go for the quality thing, you know, go for the hundred dollar shirt. Don't don't uh, don't wear cheap stuff. God wants you to have nice things. I'm saying, well, wait a minute, that's very prosperity gospel. Well, in looking at this passage, there's moral laws, and then there's a category known as separation laws. And that's that's what it's getting at here. In order to understand the Bible, very basic level. We call studying the Bible and understanding it exegesis. So looking for the exegetical idea of what did this passage mean? When the original author wrote it down, what did he mean for the original hearers or readers to understand? So this written in the time of the Exodus, the time of Moses, writing this down, giving it to the people so that they would be separate from the Canaanites. When you read through the Old Testament, the Canaanites, the people living around them that were ungodly, were always a problem in leading people away from God, leading people into idolatry. And it's believed that with the Canaanite religion, we don't actually know a whole lot about some of these Canaanite religions, but the people of Israel were getting sucked into it. And these types of mixing mating different animals, planting two kinds of seeds, wearing woven clothes, woven garments of two different materials, was a superstition people practiced for fertility, so that the gods, the Canaanite gods, would bless them with abundant crops and lots of children. So, guess what? It'd be something the Israelites wanted to do. 
well, I'm going to weave different garments together so that I have good crops and so that I could have lots of kids. Well, being a part of the Canaan practice. Well, even in, even in the Bible, there's one exception, one religious context. The high priest was supposed to wear a garment of linen, cotton, of cotton and wool woven together underneath the ephod. But only the high priest, one person, for religious purposes, was allowed to do this. For the rest, it was forbidden, so the idea was to stay away from idolatry, to keep yourselves pure. So looking at what does that mean for Christians today, we too are called to stay away from idolatry and to not mix with the world in a way that would cause us to sin or make us more like the world. Well, in looking at that today, idolatry is not a big temptation for a lot of people in the American church. As far as practicing other religions and worshiping other gods, it's still out there, but the Canaanite religions were a lot more evil than a lot of the religions that are called the great religions of the world today, the major religions of the world today. With the Canaanite religion, there was Baal, Dagon, Molech. You read about them, and a lot of them required human sacrifice. A lot of them required Molech was always called the detestable god in the Old Testament because well, people would sacrifice their own babies to this god in order to get the god's favor and their blessing. Hard to imagine. Well, years ago when I was right out of college, I took a trip to Acapulco, Mexico. And I signed up for a tour to go tour some uh, Mesoamerican pyramids. Uh, take a bus right out there and see these great pyramids. You don't hear a, as much about the pyramids in Mexico, South America, as much as you hear about the Egyptian pyramids, but they were, they were fascinating. Great civilization there. But what I didn't know when I went on the tour is this pyramid was a religious temple to the god Quetzalcoatl. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. He's a serpent god, a feathered flying serpent god. And this serpent god, I mean, the, I was saying like, oh boy, this is interesting. The Bible tells us about a serpent lowercase god. We have the serpent in Genesis. But the serpent god required human sacrifice. And in doing the tour, this god wanted people, sacrifice the people, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And in realizing that, I started to feel very disturbed and, and very sick, just sick to my stomach about it. I read a few years later in that site, they excavated a little pyramid made of human skulls, about 600 of them, men, women, children. And though it's not the Canaanite religion, there were a lot of similarities to that from learning about the Canaanite religion. So God was saying, hey, be separate. Be separate from the Canaanites. Don't practice their religions. Don't, don't even marry the Canaanite women because they'll pull you into that. Separation laws. What do, do we have anything about this in the New Testament? 2 Corinthians 16, verses 16 and 17. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. As Christians, as Christians, we're called to come out and be separate. Separate from the world. In the world, but not of the world. The Bible tells us again and again, don't do what everybody else is doing. It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. It doesn't matter what the world's doing. You do what God asks you to do. We do what God calls us to do. The world's measures of success are different priorities than what it is for the believer. Let's be 
speaks to peer pressure. We talk about peer pressure quite a bit with teenagers. Kids, teenagers, how many of you did your mother say to you if all your friends were jumping off a bridge? Would you go jump off a bridge as well? Well, of course we wouldn't. Some people might say, well, of course I would, then I wouldn't have any friends. But maybe, uh, I think of maybe one of my most uh, recent feelings of peer pressure. Being brand new in town, um, my mom has a friend here in Lincoln that she had grown up with. And uh, known their, I've known their family my whole life. And um, they invited us to the Lincoln Sportsman Buck Stew Dinner. And man, that sounds like my kind of event. I love that kind of thing, so um, my mom bought my dad and I tickets to it, so I was excited about it, and well, the, the pandemic had still been going strong, and well, I hadn't been to a lot of events in two years. I hadn't, uh, hadn't been to a restaurant in two years. Sonoma County seemed to be a lot tighter than it is here, where you seemed like you couldn't get in anywhere without wearing a mask. So I walk into the Buckstooth's dinner, I'm meeting different people, but one thing struck me, uh, nobody had a mask on. And I know masks are controversial, whether they, how much they help or don't help, but um, I'd worn a mask everywhere, but I decided, well, I don't want to be the only one in here wearing a mask. And my dad and I kind of said to each other, like, nobody has a mask on. Are you going to wear your mask? Yeah, I'd feel really weird. Are you going to wear your mask? Eh, I guess not. I don't, I'm the new guy. A lot of people here seem to know each other, so I'm not going to wear a mask. Well, we had a fantastic time. I, I even won a little prize in, in the raffle that he got from going. Um, a waterproof box and a gun sling. And uh, I think it's time with them. A few days later, halfway through the week, I find out the guy sitting next to me got COVID. And then uh, and the next day, I had COVID. <laughs> and then I gave COVID to the rest of my family. And my wife saying, like, why didn't you just wear a mask? <laughs> I'll tell you why I didn't wear a mask. Peer pressure, because I didn't want to stick out, and I wanted to be like everybody else. And I wanted to fit in, and I wanted to make some friends. Well, valuable. I plan to go next year anyway, by the way, I think, but um, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it's all over by then. <laughs> Things have changed. I, I only need a mask now if I go to the doctor, it seems. Nobody. Nobody else, but uh, peer pressure, you know, the harm in doing what everybody else is doing. But God, God calls us to be separate. God reminds us that it's okay to be different. It's okay to be the only one following the Lord, the only one not doing certain things. I think this verse is actually pretty rich in Leviticus when we understand God's intention for putting it in the Bible for us. Don't, don't mix. Don't, don't mix with the world. Doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. Believing everything in the Bible is there for a reason. And I believe doing the hard work of rightly dividing the word of truth is worthwhile. We looked at Second Timothy, where reminds us that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful. Again, in Second Timothy two fifteen, Paul writes to Timothy, "Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth." Word jumps out at me: workman. Reading the Bible is sometimes work. If you don't understand something, you have to work at it. Rightly dividing it. Now, how do we start with rightly dividing it? Well, I think the most important thing is to pray. The Bible says that we have the teacher of the Holy Spirit. 
that helps us to understand it. I don't believe that you can rightly understand a lot of the scripture without being a believer, without having placed your trust in Jesus Christ and having the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your mind guiding you. Working at it. I think of working at it, doing the hard work of just not, not passing by the hard parts, not always keeping it easy. I thought of the first time I took my son Cameron fishing. We were at Bass Lake, and he's really excited to go fishing because he's never caught a fish before. And you know, it takes a few minutes to get everything ready to tie your hooks, put your weights on, put your bobber on, and put the worm on. You cast it out, and not even five minutes ago, my camera was about five then, he said, Dad, something's wrong. We're not catching anything. Shouldn't we have caught a few by now? Well, no, you gotta, you got to work at it. Sometimes it can take all day to catch a fish. Sometimes you just got to keep trying new places, trying different baits until you get one. Or I think about another time when our family was in Utah, and we went to a site my wife found called You Dig Fossils. Drive about 40 minutes out some dirt road where there's absolutely nothing. You don't see any other vehicles. And we get out to this rock quarry. They give you a shovel and a pick. You pay a fee. And you start digging and you start splitting rocks. And at first we're, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes go by. We haven't gotten anything. We're breaking rocks. It's hard work. And it's hot out. And then pretty soon we get so excited, one of us finds a trilobite. That's this like, prehistoric type of crab creature that's inside these rocks. And it was fun, man. Once we did the hard work and split enough rocks, we'd all found a bunch of them and got to take them home. Well, doing the hard work of digging into scripture is the same thing. And looking in Leviticus 19, a few things. Idolatry is still a problem for some. I didn't realize it, but when I served in a Chinese church as the English pastor, people, people had struggles with their family lighting incense and offering food to the ancestors and different deities. And the hardest thing became when a lot of the time you'd see a grandparent die. And people, people expect, their families expect them to go to this funeral where they're doing some of these religious practices that make the believer uncomfortable. That's trying to be faithful to the word and stay away from idolatry. And for the rest of us, God's, God reminds us, be careful who you mix with. Be careful who your friends are. Be careful with what Canaanites or Gentiles you're allowing to be influenced by. That takes a lot of discernment for the believer. A lot of Christians, we can, we can have friends that are into certain things, and we can be a godly presence and evangelize them. But other things and other people, we can get sucked into it. So that takes a lot of prayer and discernment to know, should I be around this? Am I going to be able to point them toward Jesus, or am I going to get sucked into it? It's hard to answer sometimes. It, not mixing with the world calls us into, reminds us of different ideas of being different. Again, we see don't marry the Canaanite women. Well, the believer, I don't believe, should marry an unbeliever and be unequally yoked. We, we have to be very careful with what we mix with. The worldly vision of success might be very different than what God wants for you. Jesus said in Luke 16, 15, to the Pharisees, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Worldly success doesn't impress God. How much money you have, what your house looks like, what kind of car you drive, your job at work, God's not impressed by that. 
one real example I see of how God sees things versus how other people see things is really evident in the life of David, often called the man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 16, excuse me, verse 1, start at verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, and then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I named to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably I have come to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came, he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. So he sees Eliab, the firstborn, probably tall, handsome, and strong, and said, here's the new king. This guy looks like a king. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? And then he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Key verse here. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In David's family, his dad didn't even think he was worth bringing because, well, he doesn't look like a king. He's the youngest one. He's, he doesn't have the makings of the king. And then we have a chapter later in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Familiar story of David and Goliath. Read it. A few verses out of that. For Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, you know, nearly nine feet tall, taunting the, taunting the army of Israel and taunting God. Ah, your God can't save you from me. And then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be for the man who kills him. That means whoever kills this giant gets to marry the king's daughter. Hey, you get to be part of the royal family. That's the reward. Now Eliab, his oldest brother... When he, heard him, when he heard he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was roused against David. Wait, we remember Eliab from the last chapter? Eliab passed by. Was, was one of the ones that passed by. So it was when they came, Samuel looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. This is the oldest brother in the family. His anger was aroused against David. Well, maybe he's jealous that David got the anointing and said, Why did you come down here? 
And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Well, here's the thing. David's brothers and father saw a shepherd. Nothing more. God saw a king, where his brother saw a shepherd, and being incapable of doing much, God saw a king. Reminds us how God sees differently than the world sees it. What are, what are your family, friends, and co-workers see in you? I'll bet you it's quite different from what God sees inside of you and what God has for you. Come out and be separate. Don't, don't, don't mix. We, could, we get the richness from Leviticus 19, saying don't, don't mix things because you're not supposed to mix with the Canaanite. You're not supposed to be part of the world. You're supposed to be part of God's kingdom. And in this we could see the richness and encouragement to do the hard work of digging and mining the gold out of Scripture. Even when it seems like there's nothing for you. Don't skip the confusing part. Don't pass the hard parts. And don't mix with the world where God doesn't want you to. Don't be afraid to be different, as difference not always bad in God's eyes. Don't give in to unhealthy peer pressure. And as Jesus said, don't hide your light under a bushel, but let your light shine before men. Amen.